From investment expertise to complex lending advice, our wealth advisors connect your money decisions to every aspect of your life. We call it Connected Wealth. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Hein Klee. I'm the head of International for NetBank Private Wealth. Um, I'm delighted to, to host this uh, webinar that we currently are having, um, especially in this online way, I think, which we are all um, accustomed to and, and, and used to at, um, at this point in time. While we are connecting you online in this way, it is important to reflect on connectivity and connections in general, but especially when it comes to our money and financial matters. The reality is that every single financial decision we, we make affect our ability to protect what is important to us and secondly, achieve our financial goals. Before I go any further, I just want to introduce our guests and our panel today. We've got Nikki Weimer, which I think doesn't need any introduction by anyone um, that has listened to any of our NetBank uh, webinars in the last couple of weeks. Um, Adrian Seville, as an um, esteemed um, researcher in, in the South African industry. Um, from our London offices, we've got Simon Watts, which is joining us um, from our multi-manager team. And then our MC, I don't think we need to introduce Gugu too much, but Gugu, thank you very much for your time and coming through today then as well. Um, for some of you that have followed the press recently, um, I'm sitting here as a very proud member um, of NetBank Private Wealth for some of the awards that we've actually won in the last couple of months. Um, you'll see I've got a piece of paper here and the piece of paper was not because I don't know what to say, it's the awards are just so long. Um, the IntelliDex, IntelliDex Top <coughs> Private Bank and Wealth Manager South Africa 2023 awards, we actually walked away with 11 awards which I think is a great accomplishment for us as, as a business. And not to go through all of them, I just want to highlight maybe a few, which we are extremely proud of. We were the winner, top private bank in South Africa. We were the winner, wealthy family archetype, wealth management category. Uh, we were the winner in young professional and retiree archetype, private bank category. And then winner and runner up in top private banker awards in two of our bankers by Radesh Singh being the first prize winner and Louise Davies, Davies being uh, the runner-up specifically on, on those two awards. I think the importance of the IntelliDex survey is we first of all want to thank you as our clients because you actually voted for us. And the way in which the IntelliDex awards are, are actually being um, uh, designed is they ask um, our clients what do they think of us as, as a private bank and wealth manager but we also have to submit a questionnaire as well as certain case studies, which are then ultimately judged by a panel um, of experts in the industry. That was the first set of awards. And then secondly, we also won a global banking, uh, pro private banking innovation award for 2023, where we were actually the winner in the category best private bank in Africa. And I think the important part for us here is that it really comes to the, the enhancement of using analytics uh, to extend our client services and ultimately our advice uh, to our clients. Um, I was reminded the other day by one of my colleagues that I've known for many, many years, when a specific client asked a financial advisor, why should I listen to advice? And some of you might have heard this story, but I thought I'd, I'd share this because it also came up around machine learning. And if you teach a machine a certain thing, it's going to react in a certain way. And the story goes about a newlywed couple. And the wife decides to treat her husband by, by making the traditional family meal that's been passed down by generation to generation. So while he's standing in the kitchen while his wife is preparing the food, the husband notices that before she puts the meat in the pan, she cuts off all the edges. Now, not wanting to, to disturb and the newlyweds um, situation at that point in time, he leaves it. And when they stand in the kitchen doing the dishes, um, he, you know, works up the courage to ask her and says, first of all, thank you very much. It was a stunning meal. But why did you cut the edges off? He says, that was passed on from generation to generation. That's part of the meal. And that's how my grandmother taught my mother. Left it at that. Month later, they get an invite to the in-laws. 
where do you think this youngster has gone to? Straight to the kitchen. So while the mother's preparing the meal, the same thing happens. Cuts off the edges and puts it in the pan. And he says to her, but why do you cut off the best piece of, pieces of the meat? And she says, my mother taught me that and her mother taught her that. That's the way in which we prepare the meal. So he left it at that. Four months later, they get an invite to Granny. Where do you think this youngster has gone to? Straight to the kitchen. And while Granny is preparing the meat, she does the spices and she puts it directly into the pan. And he stops and he says, whoa, you forgot the most important part about the meal is to cut off the edges. And she stood for a few seconds. She says, I can't believe that they're still doing that. She says, what do you mean? She says, I stopped 20 years ago when I bought a bigger pan. <laughs> so the important part for me is go regularly back, seek advice, understand what's happening in, in the markets. And I think things like thought leadership is in many cases a lot of the ideas that we do want to generate across to our clients um, when, when it comes to financial advice. Just a few housekeeping rules before I hand over to Gugu. Um, thank you very much for submitting your questions. Um, we actually worked through the questions that came through and I can tell you there was a huge amount of interesting topics. We only have an hour, so it's very difficult to cover all of those. Um, please use the Q&A if you've got additional questions that you do want us to specifically answer. What we will also do with the questions that came through, we will work through as a team. We'll create a Q&A, which we will then make available after this webinar, where we get our experts to answer some of your, of, of your questions specifically that you've posted through to us. Um, we will make this recording also available um, after this webinar. So if any of you do uh, want to listen to it again or share it with some of your colleagues or friends, please do so. If your screen happens to freeze while we're doing the webinar, please just press the refresh button or the F5 when it specifically comes to the refreshing um, of your screen. I'm going to hand over to our MC, Gugu. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you so much, Hein. I must say, I feel like the NetBank intern. I keep on learning more the, every time I come around here. And I guess as Hein has alluded to, uh, not only do we want bigger pans, but bigger portfolios as well, given the example that he alluded to earlier today. Now, our conversation is really one that is critical for anyone who's an investor. Diversification, 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 we know is one of the number one rules to making sure that you are a successful investor. But as we know, given the geopolitical environment, high inflationary environment, despite the fact that it might be dissipating slightly, and the keen focus that we've had on central banks over the last few years, there's been ongoing noise, perhaps, that might continue to influence and shape the way you view offshore investing opportunities. Once again, you can't time it because we're always living in a volatile environment. However, it's about understanding the length of time that you choose to invest in international markets, the opportunities that exist abroad, and of course, how it plays a critical role within the construct of your portfolio, both uh, understanding the local fundamentals for us as South African investors, as we might be domiciled here, but still being global and active participants of the uh, world economy that we operate in. So today's conversation promises to be exciting, Hein. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, not only the expertise that NetBank does present, understanding the importance of diversification for investors, but of course, it's all about risk and reward. So we will be tapping into some of the, the risks that we need to be mindful of as well as we discuss this theme. Uh, a reminder to keep your questions coming through. We will be filtering through them during the course of the conversation and making sure that we address some of your pertinent questions and concerns. But let's start with the context, right? For anyone who's opened up any major news website over the last few months, you would have read a lot about the Fed, you would have seen uh, ongoing challenges in terms of geopolitical noise, and of course, uh, what we've seen in the, the likes of uh, China and the US and trade relations, and even the risks of, again, a slowing economy at a global face. Uh, and what this reminds us of, Nikki, is the fact that the world has been full of volatility for a long time. When we zone into emerging markets specifically, we're well aware that they've seen a lot of pressure points come through as well. And when we take a look at South Africa within this context, it makes for very interesting interplay uh, and dynamics. So maybe let's start there just by getting some context and understanding of the performance of emerging markets and how South Africa fits in to that particular dynamic. Yes, I think one of the things we've seen over the last two and a half years, and especially since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and we saw a rise in oil prices and in food prices the world over. And very importantly, what resulted from that, of course, was a very sharp increase, probably the most aggressive monetary policy tightening 
we have seen in over four decades, undertaken by low-risk countries. And I think this is the key here, the US and your other major advanced countries. And that has had a very big impact on emerging markets. Obviously, when a low-risk nation like the US is offering a higher return, um, for any investor, there is a specific appeal to that. Taking no risk of encountering no risk of significant default and the benefit of much higher returns that tends to attract capital out of emerging markets. So all emerging markets have been affected by the rise in U.S. interest rates in particular. And we have seen capital flowing out of emerging markets. The truth of the matter, though, is that it's been persistent. It has really been completely synchronized with the rise in U.S. interest rates, this outflow out of emerging markets. Initially, of course, China, India, troubled by COVID a bit longer than the rest of the world. That weighed on emerging markets, adding to the gloom and the negative sentiment towards emerging markets. But if we actually look at the underlying economic performance of many emerging markets, they've actually held up remarkably well. Uh, we've seen in Brazil and Mexico um, and many of your Asian countries, Malaysia, Indonesia growing at a very rapid pace. Um, equally for India, they had a, a very difficult time during COVID, but they bounced back very convincingly. And China, in fact, the largest emerging market, um, reopened at the start of this year. They lifted all their remaining COVID restrictions. But the truth of the matter is their recovery is probably been the probably been the, the least convincing of the lot. They've had, uh, they've got this constant drag coming from their property market, where all the other emerging markets people were so worried about have actually proved quite resilient. That's refreshing to hear, right? Because at some point, I guess we all panicked about the high levels of indebtedness that many of these emerging markets had and uh, uh, perhaps having to dip into borrowings to, to, to see some sense of survival post-COVID. Yes, indeed. And some, some of the countries still have those issues, but it, it, it is less an emerging market problem than it is a frontier market problem and a spe specifically an African uh, uh, concern. So in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have seen severe pressure coming not only from high global food prices, on their economies, but from the rise in U.S. interest rates and last year, the run in the dollar. And for countries with high levels of fiscal debt and of that debt, a big exposure to dollar-denominated debt, they have been particularly vulnerable. And Ghana is, of course, a good example of how that can accumulate and eventually force a country into a sovereign default. So that risk still very much exists. And it is um, still a very uh, heightened risk and something that people should be aware of, especially if they're operating in the rest of Africa. Definitely. Very important because we will come back to this one if there are opportunities by primarily okay. there. Adrian, if we come to you, though, when we talk about the theme and concept of diversification, it's always a, a gentle reminder for us as investors to think very broadly. Remind us as to why this uh, is a very key investment philosophy to have. Google, I think, you know, the point, just as a point of departure, um, when people talk about diversification, uh, diversification into what? Um, and, you know, just to, uh, to use a chart, this, uh, if you lived on Mars and you were to look at the world economy from Mars and weight uh, geography according to size of income uh, um, rather than size of uh, land area, the map that you see here uh, adjusts for um, economic footprint and South Africa's not <laughs> looking very pleasant there yeah so you know you know just put that lens on and you know when you look at your own portfolio very often portfolios are filled with what we call home bias and that that home bias is um, informed by the fact that we invest in things that are close to us that we feel we know and understand better and because they're close to us we might have better control if you lived on Mars, a Martian view would be that a South African investor should allocate perhaps no more than about half a percent of their portfolio to South Africa. And the other 99.5... Say that number again. <laughs> half a percent. Half a percent, <laughs> yes. And the other 99.5 should go to other places. In the same breath, very often, you know, my experience in working in the industry is when we uh, have conversations with investors, overwhelmingly, uh, the consideration is that international diversification equals US and dollar. And I think this chart is a very healthy reminder that the world economy is not made up of US and dollar. I mean, Nikki's making the point that there's been this affinity for dollar and US assets have done particularly well. So there's a great seduction temptation to say, well, my diversification 
is going to go and buy the usual suspects, the giants, Microsoft, NVIDIA, etc., and to buy them in dollar, what can go wrong? And so that's just a first point about diversification, is to recognize that there is a world beyond our oceans. The, the second point, um, I'll share a slide here and uh, I'll worry about the colors rather than the numbers, is diversification necessarily, for diversification to work, it's important that what you're putting into your portfolio behaves differently than what you own. And the color coding here gives some clues. So by way of example, if you are interested in diversifying away from South African equities, it's not going to help you to go and buy BRICS equities, Brazil, Russia, India, China, because they actually behave very similarly to South African equities. So just because it's got a different name doesn't mean it's a diversifier. Um, and that, I think that that's a healthy uh, reminder. And then diversification, although I'm giving the references here to equity, emphasizing that diversification is across asset classes, industries, geographies, that there are many different ways um, that you can inject diversification into the portfolio. And arguably, uh, it is, I mean, some would say it's the freest lunch. I would argue that it's the only free lunch uh, in investing. And it's the one that it is consumed least, um, but it's permanently available. The, just the last point to make on diversification is that even na naive diversification does better than no diversification. And what I mean by naive diversification, this work that I'm sharing here is from Clifford Asnes at AQR. And they, uh, 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 they imagine that you can have an option of investing only in your home economy or you can diversify into 21 other economies and you allocate about 4% to each of those economies, making up your 100% portfolio. And overwhelmingly, that naive diversification of buying something other than yourself takes you to a better place in the fullness of time. And th that fullness of time very often isn't long. I mean, here we've just got 120 months and you land up in a much better place emphasizing that things generally don't sell off together, that when assets are decorrelated, diversification really becomes a powerful part of portfolio construction. Mm -hmm. I love that this does stick to the principles as well, right? Time uh, in the market, given that uh, at least if you diversify and pursue particular options, there will be some sense of growth as well as some uh, uh, return that will be generated. Hi. That's something I think you're touching on a <coughs> critically important two points. I think a lot of people forget that if I buy a global brand I get emerging market exposure so I don't necessarily have to go and buy a China I can go and buy a McDonald's where I've got a franchise in China understanding mm -hmm. local supply problems local consumers so that's another way of getting emerging market exposure the other important thing is a lot of clients are now quite attractive by earning 5% in dollars and they park their money in cash thinking I'm okay. But I think our investment philosophy to our clients is we are not there to manage cash. And in the long run, cash will not outperform inflation. So in many cases, there's a bigger risk being out of the market than being in the market. And I think that's where the advice process that we actually have with our clients of regular check-ins to say, we are here to actually grow the money and protect you against inflation in the long run. What more if you are, you know, seeking advice as well as some solutions with winners uh, who have walked this journey before, rather than going it alone, even though there are some some positive prospects for growth there as well as a return. Correct. Before I lose eye contact, can I just say, sure. you know, what Hein uh, flags is that div the, the the merit of diversification is that not only can it give you a result with lower volatility mm -hmm. and better uh, returns in the fullness of time, but that must also be squared up against the two eaters of wealth, which is uh, tax and inflation. So, you know, here you've got another ingredient to add to the cocktail, a very powerful ingredient. Yeah. And maybe let's talk about that, right? Because asset classes are influenced by um, uh, those particular dynamics that you mentioned there, Adrian. Uh, and in a moment, we will talk about, you know, a favorable split, perhaps if there is one that uh, it might be recommended. But that's an important key aspect that you've brought to the fore here, not just equities, but understanding that there are ebbs and flows. It's influenced by the macroeconomic environment. And I guess just where we are in terms of the tide. Hi. Look, I think if you, 
I'm, I, was, I still have to meet the person with the crystal ball. <laughs> so I'm a very firm believer history will repeat itself through cycles. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did a master class for our uh, wealth managers and bankers last week. And I'm sure you guys would have heard about the Callan Institute in the US that does a Callan chart. We call it the Smarty Box mm -hmm. that looks at all of the various asset classes. And the recent one I had was back to 1984. And on a year to year basis, cash were in many cases in the bottom half, where the S&P 500 were in the top part. And I'm not talking about durations, I'm talking on a year to year basis. Mm. What was also very interesting is that the S&P 500 was never the best performing sector, but it was never the worst performing sector. So if you look at a long period of time, by parking in cash, you might feel safe, but you're actually in an asset class which historically has underperformed mm. a top 500 index, which is US based, mm. which in many cases have give you exposure to emerging markets. I'm not sure what the recent stat is, but there's a whole lot of talk around AI, chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera. And someone mentioned to me while we were, we were in London a couple of weeks back, over 50% of the listed S&P 500 companies have got some form of exposure to chat GPT or AI. Mm. So already just looking at that as an index mm -hmm. is one thing that one can do. But adding also to your other point, where there is this home bias, what worries me, and it's been a trend for many, many years now, we actually have a shrinking stock market. Mm. We don't have yeah. new With listings the coming -listings, in. Yep. So you've got your dominant plays in the Rand hedges. Yep. Also go and look at the volumes. Your biggest volumes on a day-to-day -day basis is mainly three or four shares. So if you take the foreigners out of it, mm. there's not gonna be actually that much trade that actually happens on the JSE. And when it comes to the price, willing buyer, willing seller, you need that momentum in the long run. Very true. And looking at the other uh, parts of the stock market, the resource stocks, very heavy, cyclical as well in terms of uh, the performance of commodity prices. So I guess one thing is certainly clear. Diversification is important. What it is that you're diversifying into is also critical. And as we have, we've understood that the world is a lot bigger than the U.S. But the U.S. is a market we could just can't ignore whether or not we like it it does play a significant role and in influence in our investment decisions uh, the performance of the global economy as well as opportunities for us to invest in and perhaps simon this is a good point for you to come in here we've kept you quiet for long enough we we understand the fundamentals of uh, offshore uh, allocation and investment opportunities but let's talk about the us for a minute here and maybe you can share your perspective uh, not only on the opportunities that exist in this market but the risks as well that are typically faced by the world's biggest economy Yeah, sure. So in terms of the U.S., I mean, I mean, I mean yeah, there's a lot of uh, noise at the moment in terms of what's going on in terms of the macro. We've seen we've seen the macro side of things in terms of the impact of higher interest rates and also to combat higher inflation. Um, but we've also got this in a context of quite a strong economic backdrop in the sense of we've still got strong labor markets, which is in a, in a sense what you wouldn't really expect in this sort of environment. I think it's kind of a bit of a hangover effect from the pandemic, shortage of supply of labor markets, um, and that influence in terms of uh, the lack of labor and therefore pushing up wages, so keeping inflation relatively high. I think what we're seeing also, and I think we've talked about it in terms of uh, some what we've seen in terms of the rally recently, it's been quite concentrated in terms of an equity market rally, largely focused in large cap IT stocks. Uh, we've got, um, I mean, that you, you've had various statistics in terms of the number of stocks, large cap stocks that have driven the market. I mean, seven, seven large cap stocks in the IT sector have driven large amount of the returns so far year to date largely related to artificial intelligence and there's some hype around that i mean some of it is related to also the the um i suppose the flight to safe quality it as well remember what what happened during the uh, earlier parts of the year when we had the kind of concerns over the regional banks in the us uh, with svb we also had that knock on effect in europe in terms of credit Suisse. so we had a lot of uh, th th i mean Ultimately, there has been a lot of noise and uncertainty. And I, I would say that markets generally experience a lot of noise and uncertainty. So that's not unusual. I would say 
we've probably had a bit more recently. And I think the large driving factor behind that is the, the impact of higher inflation. We haven't had inflation this high for some time. You could say it's now peaking and coming over, which is good news. But uh, and we've had higher interest rates for some time, uh, uh, kind of like the highest interest rates for some time as well. So there has been a huge amount of a noise and uncertainty going around. It's been a concentrated equity rally. Um, we've touched on uh, the kind of the geopolit some geopolitical events that's happened, obviously, that's been influencing uh, the market in terms of Russia, Ukraine. You've got concerns over China. You've got China, Taiwan potentially impacting um, the geopolitical uh, uh, makeup. You've got concerns over U I mean, so there are lots of um, uncertainties out there in terms of um, the, not only the macro, but also the geopolitical. So I think it's quite an opportune time to talk about the benefits of diversification. And then on, on the next slide, um, I mean, the way we look through the noise and uncertainty, I mean, it's essentially three key, key elements I think it's really important to have. I mean, it's important to have a really clear investment process, repeatable, well-structured investment process that essentially looks through the noise because it can be easily, you can be easily distracted by the noise that's going on. There's lots of noise for a 24 hour, a 24 hour news channel, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's, it's, a, it's easy to be distracted. So you need to have that kind of like clear structure and investment process uh, that we, I mean, we follow in terms of following how you look at different asset classes, how you value those, and also how you want to allocate them in a risk uh, kind of like profiled way. So not only is it having a clear investment process, but as we've talked about already, it's extremely important to have diversification. And we diversify a lot on, on different levels. We diversify across asset classes because we're multi-asset. So we invest in equities, bonds, real assets, alternatives, and cash. And it, we invest globally, so we invest across region. We talked about having no home bias. We don't have a home bias here. We don't have a UK bias. We don't have a SA bias. We, we invest globally. Our benchmarks are in equities are global, uh, the MSCI world, and in, in bonds, they're the global ag. So we don't have any bias there. In terms of strategy and style, we have um, a kind of a style. We we tilt the portfolios in terms of active versus passive. We we don't have a, too much of a preference between the two. We we can tilt the style from growth to quality. We can tilt this um, in, within fixed income. We can be short duration, long duration. So diversification across the board in terms of different style and strategy. And then ultimately we select funds. Um, and so we have. An inbuilt diversification there in terms of we're looking to, um, I suppose, select managers that are experts in their field in those particular areas. So fixed income, equities, and particularly maybe within equities, it might be they're, they're particularly good at picking value stocks. Maybe within credit or fixed income, they, they look very good at picking investment grade credit bonds. So we have a broad range of diversification at different levels. Um, across the board. And I think finally, I just wanted to point out is it's really important just to be able to have in your toolkit the ability to kind of tilt the portfolio or to have broad diversification across uh, different asset classes because uh, that, that will help because at the high level of uncertainty, there are potentially lots of multiple different outcomes. Definitely. Simon, I'm glad that you've given us some insight into the secret sauce that you use here at NetBank in terms of a, a, a toolkit as well as a strategy that uh, proves to be quite efficient. There are a few questions that are streaming in and a uh, largely majority of them really focused on the US, what we're seeing in terms of China and of course opportunities right across emerging markets. So maybe let's take it region by region, perhaps focusing on the US, shifting off to China briefly, opportunities in Europe as well as emerging markets. Uh, again, thinking of uh, the the, the base of the toolkit that you've given us, looking at asset classes, region, uh, strategy and style, uh, and some of the influencing factors there. When we talk about the US, we know that the dollar uh, is a currency that everybody likes in terms of investment opportunities and, uh, um, I guess, just its strength as a global currency. 
But anyone who's taking a look at the performance of the dollar of late would have seen that there's some waning that's happening there. Uh, uh, give us uh, your perspective as well, Nikki. I guess from a macroeconomic point of view, the concerns and the risks around the U.S. dollar and perhaps how that has ripple effects into U.S. equities. If we take a look at where we are with the current news flow regarding inflation, interest rate stance from the U.S. Federal Reserve and, of course, uh, where they are in terms of the geopolitical crisis or battle uh, with China. But the dollar first? Yes, certainly on the dollar, I think it's all about interest rate differentials and expectations of where it is likely to go over the next 12 to 18 months. All there to tell us where you might see it? <laughs> well, I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, global inf globally inflation is turning. In the U.S., we're seeing a very rapid deceleration in inflation. Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of that is coming off a high base, so there is that level of distortion in the numbers. There is noise in the inflation numbers across the board coming off a high base, so the base is inflating that deceleration. We're also seeing, of course, global oil prices are still fairly low. They're back to sort of pre-pandemic averages, um, and that's helped bring down inflation. Global food inflation, the outlook very uncertain now with mm -hmm. Russia um, basically withdrawing from the grain initiative or grain exporting deal they had mm. with the Ukraine and also with El Nino brewing in the background. There's a lot of uncertainty there. I think they will probably hike further. Uh, the U.S. Fed will probably hike interest rates one more time. I don't see space for another one. I think inflation is definitely coming down. Um, in the UK, inflation is at much higher levels. Yep. It, it appears to be a lot more, a lot stickier. I think in the UK, very similar to South Africa, there's some structural issues mm. that relate to inefficiencies they've introduced into their own economy as a result of political decisions mm. regarding Brexit and so forth that might be affecting uh, the way their inflation trajectory is moving. And then in Europe, also, we're seeing a convincing downward trend, but of course, they are very close to the dislocation caused by the war and uh, very exposed to Russian energy sources and also to Ukrainian food supplies. Mm -hmm. um, so that could have an impact on them. Overall, I think inflation will be trending lower, which means we should be close to the peak of the rate hiking cycle. Um, maybe there's one more in it, but I don't think much more than that. And what it's all about at the moment with the dollar weakening is that the investors are looking at the situation and they're saying, wait a minute, um, maybe there's one more hike. The US, US inflation is coming down much faster than in Europe than in the UK. Yep. And therefore, US interest rates in the US should be closest to the peak. And when they start cutting, they will probably cut faster and sooner than the others. And it's that interest rate differential that is now resulting, um, or the expectation that it will turn against the US that is resulting in a weaker US dollar. And I think that will continue. The market's sensing that peak. They're smelling it. And they're anticipating and already looking forward to the cuts in US interest rates coming through. Got you. Yeah. What does this mean for the equities market space, though? Hi? I Asia? think, you know, without having the crystal ball, um, and Stats needs to remind me, and Nikki might be able to help me here, but I think the U.S. is the only country in the world that's got all of its foreign denominated debt in dollars. Hmm. So currency doesn't really matter to them. So mm -hmm. that's one factor that we have to take into consideration. Um, I know if you look at them on balance sheet, they are very close to being bankrupt as a, as a company, if I can call it that way. Yeah. But I think there's two things we should never forget about the U.S. It's a very entrepreneurial market. Very few people actually want to work for a company. They want to start their own. And I think that is driven through in consumer spending. So that's another factor that we specifically have to look at. And I'll never forget um, when I was at university um, through textbooks, um, the professor used to remind us once in your lifetime, you'll be where a economy is at full employment or more. And I think that's where we are in the US right now. There's mm -hmm. actually more vacancies than people that are actually working. Mm -hmm. So if you take those factors into consideration, being trained and educated as an economist, we sometimes at macro level are very negative. Mm -hmm. But it's at that stage where you actually go to fund selection, stock selection, etc., where a lot of the opportunity sets are sitting specifically at this point in time. Um, I don't know if, if, if some of you saw um, this morning there was an announcement of a luxury brand that's coming in to sponsor, I think it's the it's either the football or something of this nature. So it's the first time a luxury brand is actually coming in as a major sponsor. Now the question is, have any of you been in London with the Chinese standing buying luxury goods? Mm -hmm. The queues are very, very long. So I think there's still a lot of wealth 
The other thing that I also saw last week, since 1984, it's the first time where both inflows into bond funds and ETFs and equity uh, funds or mutual funds and ETFs are negative. So remember, there's a huge amount of cash right now parked on the side. And I think a lot of consumers and investors are waiting for, are we getting that dip? Yep. And are we seeing a recovery? Are we going into a soft landing? Are we actually seeing a recession? A lot of uh, um, commentators at this specific point in time say we might be in one or two quarters of negative growth. Mm. Might not be a hard landing, mm -hmm. but I think there's a huge amount of cash right now sitting on the sideline waiting to go back into the market. So cash has been king, but only for the short, short term. And of course, we need to adapt to the cycles that we're in, right? Correct. But also just bear in mind that through COVID and even before that, yep. interest rates were actually near zero levels. In some cases in Europe, you were paying the bank mm. to hold cash. That's true. So you've gone from zero to five in a space of a year. That's a big jump. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, the comfort level, that blankie that I want to keep, I'm yeah. very comfy now. But with inflation sitting at these rates, after tax, you're actually sitting with a negative growth rate mm. in real terms. So I really do think it's buying the right strategy buying yourself and affording yourself the right time frames. A lot of our clients say, well, I want to go into the stock market and do a 20% in a year. We can't do that. But you can at least do 20% potentially over a five-year period. Mm -hmm. So also take that into consideration. Align your risk with a time frame and let the money actually then work for you. Let's talk about time frame, though, because that's also difficult to determine. Just a few years ago, we had the COVID-19 pandemic. Before that, it was Brexit. Uh, a few months before that or after that, it was the U.S. elections, which we're also looking to face next year. So we're always living in this world of constant noise and volatility, where just when you think you've got your five-year plan set for you, boom, here's another black swan event. <laughs> you see, but that's where, that's where the, the real benefit of advice comes through. Yeah. It's not what asset class to go into. It's not what stock to pick. It's doing the right things at the right time and not doing the wrong things at the wrong time. Mm. Um, I can almost tell you that when COVID struck, uh, most people actually would have sold off and parked in cash. Yep. And 60% of the people actually never went from cash back into the market with a rally of this nature. Mm. I think what I sometimes use as a rule of thumb is that if you want a 5% return over inflation at a year, to the percentage. So if it's a 5% outperformance of inflation, look at at least six years in the market. If you look at seven years, look at at least nine years in the market. Mm. Why? Because you go through cycles. And I think it's the importance of having regular feedback with your wealth, wealth manager, your financial planner, um, and actually doing your own research. And don't always believe the first topic that comes up on Google. Because nine out of 10 times, it's not a reliable source. Mm -hmm. It's not the information that you should be doing. And it's most likely the wrong thing that you'll do at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that because so often as investors, we do get swayed by the news flow, right? And perhaps Simon and Adrian, this is one for you. Whether it's the FANG stocks or uh, the likes of NVIDIA that have uh, become a lot more popular. And then we saw a sell-off in some of those stocks uh, just after the, uh, pan the advent of the pandemic. Uh, and now there's this rage around EV, uh, electronic vehicles, right? So there's a lot of excitement around sexy stocks, stocks sexy sectors uh, that become a lot more attractive. And even if you look at the recent news flow regarding Twitter, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, even looking at Meta, that's where we tend to gravitate towards. So help us understand how to discern appropriately regarding great opportunities uh, for your investment strategy and that could work for your portfolio versus just the noise. Uh, and again, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, group think mentality uh, instead of making sure that it's uh, tailored to your specific needs as an investor. Adrian? Um, so there's a couple of things you flag there. Um, the first is just from a from a from an investment uh, perspective. Uh, one thing that very often is lost in conversations is that investing is not just about buying good assets; it's about paying the right price for those assets. You buy a great asset at the wrong price, you've just made a bad investment. Mm. Um, Simon's alluded to it, but uh, and, and perhaps to some extent, uh, uh, Nick, you also, I'm, I've got reservations about the U.S. Um, I'll go on to thin ice here um, <laughs> and I'll walk there. very, very carefully. But m my reservations, uh, you know, Simon alluded to it, is that the driver of S&P 500 this year, for instance, uh, 
there's overwhelmingly seven names that those seven names explain the 15 percent return that you've seen in the s p 500 the other 493 stocks have delivered zero um, and so there is a growing uh, differential in the valuation between these uh, seven darlings and the rest of the market. Mm -hmm. I would uh, 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 lean in the direction of the rest of the market if I'm looking for valuation. In the same breath, um, if you scan uh, currencies from a purchasing power parity perspective, the US dollar remains very expensive. That uh, the dollar will buy you lots of things elsewhere in the world, which means if you're using the rest of the world's currencies, you're going to get less mm. in dollar. So my preference would be to shop away from the US, that you've got very high quality businesses. Now, Heinz sort of alluded to it, that you can buy businesses that might have a particular geography, but their reach is global. Gotcha. Um, you know, whether that's Taiwan Semiconductor or Nestle, um, you know, just for uh, the sake of uh, well-known examples. Uh, the, the third thing, you know, that uh, I think needs to be underlined is that, um, uh, and to stay with Simon's references, that diversification is uh, across not as many asset classes as possible, but asset classes that behave as differently as possible. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at his chart, what I love there is there's reference to music royalties. You know, that's a lovely component to put into a basket because it's going to be recession resilient. Mm -hmm. So who knows if recession is coming? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, here's a part of my basket that will walk through recession really well. Litigation funds mm -hmm. are another good example. Got you. And I think that's really important for us to bear in mind and, and look at those particular options. We'll come back to that uh, uh, opportunity that we need to pursue outside of the U.S. Uh, and talk about uh, some of those themes further. But Simon, your thoughts and a build up as well to uh, what, what Adrian has uh, built up on uh, avoiding, you know, just the popular stocks and popular investment strategies and perhaps the outlook that we need to bear in mind as investors when it comes to that toolkit you shared with us. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, in terms of AI, I mean, it's very exciting. It does. It does remind me of the kind of dot com era that we did experience early, uh, early in two thousand. Um, I mean, you don't know ultimately who the winner is going to be. Really, um, I think there's going to be a large capital expenditure required for um, AI to work. Um, so therefore, that does kind of it does suggest the kind of incumbents might be the winners. But you don't just know. You don't know. I mean, in a gold rush, they say you should buy. Um, this, we should be the supplier of the spades or even the jeans that uh, people wear. So it's it's ultimately um, hard to distinguish who the ultimate winner is going to be. There is this thing called the hype cycle, and I think we're going up this hype cycle. Because you do go fall back down, and then there's a kind of a, a plateauing in terms of actually how it's going to be monetized and how it's going to be useful in terms of um, of growth going forward. I think there are some clear advantages of AI. Um, the winners and losers, it's hard to be distinguished by. I think it's a very good point that made by the panel in terms of valuations. You've got to be cognizant of valuations for future returns. Uh, lots of these stocks have priced in a huge amount in terms of expected future returns. So be, be careful in terms of that. I think our focus in terms of this area is we've been biasing the portfolio towards more quality stocks. And quality in terms of a robust balance sheets, uh, kind of a, 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 you being able to protect their margins and a low leverage as well. So we've been biasing our portfolio in the direction of that particular style. Um, and that's premised in the kind of like the outlook that we have, which is perhaps for a slower growth in outlook. So those sorts of quality stocks should do well in, the, in a slower growth environment. If we shift for a moment outside of the U.S. and maybe focus on Britain before talking about BRICS as well, as there are a few questions that have come through on that one. Uh, a key question that we got from one of our earlier audience members was uh, on Britain. Why are interest rates there uh, and growth, so share growth rather, so meagre uh, in Britain? And I guess that's for someone who's looking to explore opportunities in that market as well as some parts of uh, 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 Europe. Nikki, hi, can you oh. take this one? I've, I've given my, uh, my sort of impression of the British economy. I think mm. they've got challenges. Uh, listen, it is still uh, um, a Western 
rich world advanced economy. There is no denying that there are skills and capabilities there. <clears throat> but they've made certain decisions that I think that have presented them with challenges other economies don't have at this point. And so for Britain, I think a, a very important bit would be to let go of the isol uh, isolation mentality and, uh, you know, return to the roots that made them an incredibly prosperous country, mm -hmm. which is to be part of the world economy, to be a major um, uh, contributor to global trade, um, and uh, to reassert its position as a financial hub. I think that is that is important and obviously embrace new opportunities. But I think in the interim, they are carrying some of the costs of Brexit, uh, some of the you know ripple effects that m that might have had, which is why growth has been disappointing. And interest rates, well, if you've got inefficiencies and you've got rising global oil prices and food prices mm -hmm. um, and uh, all of those sorts of things, and you've got the nature of the post-pandemic recovery, which was driven by demand for goods um, and, uh, you know, and you've got inflation all over the place and, 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 and throughout the world, then if you've got inefficiencies, that amplifies your inflationary experience and that contributes to higher interest rates, which, of course, squeezes consumers. So I think that explains their current situation. But in terms of their equity markets, I'll leave it to the experts. I think what, what we've seen, um, demand from our clients is not necessarily going into the equity market. Mm -hmm. If you really think of it, it's, it's very much still commodity based. So it's mm -hmm. very highly correlated to, to the South African market when it comes to commodities. We have seen demand from clients wanting to buy property mm -hmm. for buy and let. And what's interesting, and, and Simon, you can, you can jump in here if you want. An uh, interesting trend that we're seeing in the UK is a lot of overutilized office spaces, which are being converted into luxury apartments. And a lot of people, especially the Chinese, are coming in, buying these, and then basically letting them stand in empty due to the fact that they know over time, um, you know, the property price will go up. Um, I think Simon and a few of our colleagues in, in the UK reminded us that in the, in the UK, they've got fixed interest rates. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those are coming up for renewals which were at levels of one and a half to two, Ooh. and all of a sudden now it's five, six. Mm. So when it comes to the consumer, I think the actual UK consumer, they might be struggling um, from, from that perspective. Um, we, we spoke a little bit earlier about dollar and, and, and sterling yes. um, right now. It's still the preference from our clients to actually hold dollar assets. I think about 75% of our asset base and investment base is dollar based. And you have the hardliners that prefer to keep the queen's or the, sorry the king's currency mm -hmm. if i can call it that way to keep sterling but the majority of our clients actually will go the dollar route and it's the importance thereof of having the diversification into unhedged asset classes or currencies such as pound euro um you know etc from from that perspective got you simon yeah. go sorry. ahead adrian you want to go to sir? Shall I make a very quick point about uh, uh, UK? So my concern about the UK is they cut themselves off from their principal client, Europe. Um, so Brexit was foot shooting perfected. Um, and they really need to think very, very hard about how they reverse that. Politically, you know, they need to save face. Um, notwithstanding Brexit, they've got three other problems. The one is it's an underinvested economy, yep. gross domestic fixed investment. So they need to make those investments in infrastructure. Uh, somewhat related is productivity uh, is sagging um, and has dragged in that economy for a long time. And the third, again, somewhat related, is that it, uh, it has the attributes of an aging population. Mm -hmm. And you put all of those things into a bucket, isolation, underinvestment, productivity, and demographic decay, you've got an economy that's going to struggle. Got you. Is that a relatively high tax rate? Yeah, yeah. indeed. Yeah. They are very the aging is a Western. Uh, it's a global. It's thing. A, yeah, well, it's an advanced country phenomenon. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not so much a absolutely emerging it's not market of young populations. Your your rich countries have older populations, but what I think perhaps you've got is a situation where in America, because of the entrepreneurial spirit, because of the innovation, they have used technology. Um, far more creative, uh, creatively to boost productivity than perhaps other advanced countries have managed. Got you. Look, I think the other thing that you also notice in the UK, if you 
a regular traveler to the UK is the amount of EV cars that are on the road. Mm. Every second car that you actually spot on the road is EV with their green um, number plate. And I believe, Simon, from utilizing that, there's tax breaks. And you don't pay that heavy uh, tax of coming into the city at the moment. So they're encouraging them. The black cabs that we all used to jump in, that was diesel suggers like you can't believe it. Yeah. The majority of them are now EV. Got so you. there's a big adoption of that. Got you. We've got about 10 minutes left and there are quite a few questions that have come through. And perhaps this is an open one to the panel. Uh, perhaps, Adrian, you can respond. And maybe Simon will get your thoughts on this one if you do look at uh, BRICS. But it says, BRICS in mind, with BRICS in mind, what are your thoughts around uh, general investing in these particular markets? Is it too early to evaluate? And I assume for South Africans, this is top of mind given the BRICS summit that's coming up, the news flow out of Russia, opportunities coming from uh, uh, India, and of course, pressure points in South Africa. Adrian? I'll try and do one line on each of them. <laughs> so uh, Russia, it's a, it's a completely hypothetical, uninvestable. Um, uh, India is, I think, going to be the power grower. Structurally, it's got all of the ingredients that make it look best for the next decade or two. Young population, high investment rates, opening up foreign direct investment coming in, strong productivity growth. However, the Indian market uh, is expensive. Um, China is uh, really going to do, uh, I think, global chest beating um, and has overtaken the U.S. in terms of purchasing power parity adjusted economy. Sure. Increasingly uh, innovative. The real drag for China is their aging population. So mm. you know, Nikki says most uh, advanced economies have aging populations. China is one of the very few emerging economies that has an aging population. They're going to have the one to child policy. Yeah, you yes. know, so they're going to have to wrestle that. They've also overinvested. So just as the UK is underinvested, China has overinvested. But I wouldn't. What I wouldn't take away from them is uh, their. Uh, iteration, evolution into high innovation industries um, and valuations in China look attractive. Uh, Brazil, you're buying South Africa. Ah, you did one line on all of them except for China. So we know we <laughs> you're quite <laughs> bullish on that quite clearly. An interesting one that we got from Rod as well. Simon, I'll throw this to you first and then see if there's a response here in studio. Is there risk that the US dollar will be withdrawn and replaced by cryptocurrency? We expected this one to come up. Your thoughts, Simon? <laughs> we thought the cryptocurrency question would come up. Um, so in terms of short answer would be no. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, our thoughts on cryptocurrency, I mean, we, we don't, we, we see it as purely a speculative asset. Uh, well, virtually an instrument, let's just say, not even an asset class. So, I mean, if, if uh, it's obviously very volatile, it's, not regulated and i think there's a threat that it's going to be regulated people are focused on it because they think it's going to be um basically uh only direction is going up because of limited supply but then my 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 response to that is there's lo there's many many different types of cryptocurrency so why why do, why do we favor one over the other um i think there's going to be increasing regulation if if popularity increases, the governments are going to regulate them out of existence. And I think that there's no store of value given the volatility. You can't either use them to ex kind of exchange for goods and services. So you might be getting the impression I'm not really a fan of cryptocurrency. Um, but yeah, so it's, I would say the US dollar, if we focus on the US dollar, it's, it's seen as, yeah, I mean, obviously the currency the safe haven currency of the world. It dominates um, the large markets in terms of um, the amount of assets that are priced in dollars. So you've got probably over 60% of the world equity markets uh, dominated in the US. You've got more than the, that in terms of fixed income. So I would say there's a long way to go and I would be very skeptical if anything like that happened. Got you. 
Hein, a question that I'd like to bring to you. I'm noting that a lot of our uh, questions are from uh, retirees or individuals who are very close to uh, their retirement age and uh, are obviously quite cautious about uh, the kind of annuity that they might select, whether it's guaranteed or living annuity, the investment options that might still be available to them, and I guess just their risk profiles, right, given their, their appetite. Uh, and one particular question that we have from uh, Pit Janse van Rensburg asks, why does common wisdom teach that when you retire, you need to park your money in cash? Maybe let's tackle that and also understand how we should be considering it now, uh, given the waves of volatility and change and opportunities that still exist for those close to I retirement. I don't know if that question was directed to me because I was an <laughs> asset consultant before <laughs> I joined NetBank, but I fully agree. Sure. In, in actual fact, we are going into an age where people are living longer. Yep. So the biggest problem you can have is to de-risk before you retire and then to de-risk totally while you are retired. Mm -hmm. So I'm of the opinion you should actually be more aggressive. You can actually, and, and, and in many cases, what we consulted to uh, the previous role I had, when we consulted to medical schemes, we applied the same kind of asset liability modeling to an annuity than what you would do with a, with a medical scheme. So medical scheme money comes in con from contributions, claims are paid out, and you've got this reserve to actually fund you over time. So in many cases, what we found is that a portion of your potential retirement money can go into cash for a year or two to actually meet your liquidity requirements. Mm -hmm. But the rest of that should actually be sitting in at least a balanced portfolio. And it's work that our head of investments actually did for us to say, what is the drawdown rate that I can afford yep. from a average balance fund? And the history has showed us that if you keep the balance fund, and we just took the average, you can comfortably withdraw 7% per year without eating into capital. Mm. So the problem that you have, added on top of that, which a lot of people don't realize, is your inflation rate when you retire change. It shifts from general inflation to medical inflation. That's another 2% above. Well, people say it's 2 I think it's more than 4 So your capital actually needs to work harder mm. while you're in retirement than when you are not retired. And it, it, it's uh, hopefully some advice that we're putting into the younger generation. The sooner you start saving to build up that nest egg before you retire, don't expect to go to your financial advisor a week before you retire and say, I need to draw down 20% a year, make your magic work. It's not going to work. Yeah. But I think the important part here is I, I'm of the firm belief that you shouldn't go conservative. Um, I think there was a joke in the US to say the best time to buy an annuity is five years before you retire because the company that you actually are buying it f from is de-risking the portfolio already before you start drawdowns. So if you apply that mentality to it, um, I'm of the firm belief that a, a properly managed, diversified, balanced portfolio should actually meet the requirements of the average uh, pensioner that, that's living in South Africa. Got you, definitely. And I do think it would be worthwhile to have an ongoing conversation, which I know will come up in uh, upcoming uh, conversations and webinar series around the various tra tax structures, right? And yep. uh, how to uh, adequately position that, uh, regardless of where you might be investing from an offshore point of view. We have about three minutes before we uh, have to wrap up. And I guess one of the key takeaways that we all need to understand that has been uh, highlighted by all each of our panelists is diversification is important. Not just what you're diversifying into, but where as well understanding the strategy that you put in place, also being aware of the fact that uh, there are uh, various models and styles that you can implement, whether it's investing in a company that offers you greater exposure and diversification to different uh, markets and geographics, but of course also making sure that uh, value is important. Buying a great investment at a huge or significant cost is not necessarily the best investment decision that one will take. But now that we've got some of these nuggets in place, and I guess many of us are reflecting on where we are on our personal investment journeys, some a lot more mature than others and having had exposure to the market for a while, and others perhaps still re-evaluating how they need to uh, understand the construct, the risk and the rewards and the opportunities that certainly do exist. Give us one key takeaway from each of you before we do wrap up and uh, hand over to Hein. Simon, I think I'd like to start off with you. Uh, often South Africans are very skeptical uh, and don't always see the world beyond our borders as well as the US. But perhaps you can enlighten us on, you know, one key takeaway that uh, we need to be mindful of uh, when it comes to our offshore allocation going forward in 30 seconds. <laughs> so in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, my personal takeaway would be invest, obviously, for the long term. If you can, 
invest over time. So invest gradually and, and you get that magic of compounding over time. Um, it's the eighth wonder of the world. I think Einstein described it as. So you get the magic of compounding. So start early, invest regularly and diversify. So have a broad investment approach um, and uh, invest according to your risk profile in, in terms of the, obviously the longer time frame you have, the more risk you can take. So I would say that obviously look at areas of value, the cheap areas of value um, and diversify across regions and multi-asset classes. I know that's rather broad, but I think that's quite a good long-term message. Definitely. Nikki, if I can come to you, because there will be a, a lot of um, noise, I guess, from a macroeconomic point of view. So get used to it. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Yeah, I think that's the key takeaway here. <laughs> we are living in a world, um, and perhaps every generation would say that, where there is a lot of crises, where we are facing significant challenges, where there's a vol lot of volatility. And I think one of the, 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 the most beautiful outcomes for me here that's made me think is that you need to focus on assets that behave differently. Mm. I think that's a, that's a key point that I think have emerged from today's uh, discussion for me personally. Got you. Keen to underscore that, Adrian? I think uh, diversification is easily identified. It's assets that behave differently. Um, and will counterbalance each other uh, that uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that even naive diversification does much better than no diversification and that um, you know most portfolios uh, very often are under diversified mm -hmm. and that by doing a simple thing, for instance, putting precious metals alongside an equity portfolio, yep. in the fullness of time you will land up with lower volatility i.e. a better journey and uh, an improved terminal destination. I find that refreshing because it's not just SA versus the world, but rather Absolutely. asset classes and uh, investment outlooks and, uh, that uh, differ from each other. Hein, you can wrap it up for us as uh, you do close it up for us here today. Before I close, I think two things I'd like to take from this is one, seek proper wealth planning advice. Yep. And I'm not only talking about which asset class to go in, what country to go in is tax considerations, estate planning considerations, all of those are various factors which one should consider even before you actually place your money offshore. Mm -hmm. Because in many cases, that's where you actually stumble. Um, I'm a very firm believer that artificial intelligence will play itself out in something that I wanna call intelligence, uh, intelligent assistance. So there's a whole hype about what a machine can do now. A lot of people are fearless or f feared at this point in time that they, they lose their jobs. But I think it's utilizing this as an assistant in the way in which we potentially will be doing asset allocation decisions, macroeconomic modeling, all of those kind of things. So I do think there's definitely a play in it, but it's the assistance thereof. Mm. And I don't think the human will actually ever, in most cases, be obsolete when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. So just from my side, Gugu, Nikki, Adrian, Simon, from our side, thank you very, very much for sharing this hour of your time with us. I think it was a very interesting discussion that we specifically had. We can go on for days. Um, I'm sure we can. Um, just in some closing remarks, um, I would like to invite you um, to a smaller uh, interactive session that we are planning on the 15th of August between 10 and 11. And I think the, the theme that we have there is specifically around international investing. And there we'll actually drill down into more of our process, how do we consider the US versus uh, the UK? How do we consider um, asset classes and the tools that we potentially will use um, in investing in our international uh, portfolios? Um, just remember, you can also go to our, our website where there's more um, thought leadership insights, some recordings of previous webinars um, and various articles that were specifically written from experts within NetBank Private Wealth of which one of them is also our philanthropy offering. Um, I think your views do matter to us, so please give us some of your feedback so we can improve our webinars going forward. And then finally, um, just to thank everyone that is connected with us today online for this webinar. Um, we really look forward to connecting to you guys soon. Um, as I've mentioned, we received quite a lot of questions. We will work through those, give you guys um, some feedback, we'll reach out to our experts for their comments and we will publish that then as a Q&A uh, to the audience that attended today and for future use. Thank you very much.